We're coming to you from the Tony Remby Rock Auditorium at the Commonwealth Club. It's week to week, the political roundtable, and it is Monday, July 16th, 2018. Welcome everybody to our program. Um, on Sunday, former presidential candidate Hillary Clinton, she noted on Twitter that the World Cup had ended successfully and that uh, Vladimir Putin was meeting with Donald Trump despite all these calls for Trump to cancel the meeting due to those uh, 12 indictments of Russians that Robert Mueller handed down recently. Clinton tweeted, and I quote, Great World Cup, question for President Trump as he meets Putin. Do you know which team you play for, unquote? <laughs> tough words, tough words. I'm John Zipperer, I know I play for the Commonwealth Club team. <laughs> where I'm the Vice President of Media and Editorial, and I'm very pleased to be your host for tonight's Week to Week program. Thank you. Now, tonight we're going to talk about... <laughs> I don't know. What, what can we talk it's about, It's a great John? question. What should we talk about? <laughs> we're going to talk about, of course, the summit meeting in Finland, uh, as well as uh, some Senate and Governor's race news, uh, the Supreme Court, and we'll see what else we can fit in this hour, and we'll end it with our live news quiz. Um, and of course, the Commonwealth Club is a place for people with a wide variety of views. So any opinions expressed up here are those solely of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. Now let's meet our panelists for today. On the far end of the stage is John F. Rothman. He's a talk show host with KGO 810 AM. Welcome back, John. He's on Twitter at John Rothman. And next to me is Carla Marinucci, senior writer for the Politico California Playbook. Welcome back, Carla. You can follow her on Twitter at C. Marinucci. Um, Joe Garofoli of the San Francisco Chronicle was going to be joining us tonight, but he was called away on assignment. So we look forward to having him join us for a future date. Uh, there are question cards spread throughout the room. I think you all know how we do this. Write down some questions. People will collect the cards, bring them up to me, and I will try to ask as many as possible during the hour. Now, on to our round table. Um, perhaps not <laughs> since National Lampoon's European vacation. <laughs> Has a trip to the continent gone so awry? Um, earlier today, President uh, Donald Trump met with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Finland. They reportedly met one-on-one, -on -one, no advisors, though I believe they had translators. Um, following their meeting, they held a press conference that sent many Republicans and Democrats alike into fits. So let's actually start with the press conference, and we'll also talk about the European trip. Um, but uh, Carla, I mean, uh, actually, let me read this. Yeah. Former CIA director John Brennan, a, a, a Democrat, it should be noted, but he called Trump's press conference uh, performance, quote, nothing short of treasonous, unquote. <laughs> As we get into some of these other quotes a little later, yeah, right. no, I, I'm, I'm actually very serious. There are Republicans who are using the, that, that language as well. So. Carla, let's start with you. Wow. What made wow. this such a, uh, an unusual I mean, yeah, event? I mean, uh, we were talking. Boy, I have been covering these things for a long time. In fact, uh, I, for the San Francisco Examiner, I covered the downfall of the Soviet Union. I was there when Rush, uh, you know, Wilson went on the tanks and covered the last meeting of the Politburo uh, in the Kremlin. And so to watch the, an American president today stand next to a man who has murdered journalists, who has uh, murdered his <laughs> adversaries, uh, who has annexed Crimea, I mean, we, the list goes on, was uh, a, just a mind blower. I think a jaw dropping. I think w most of us have never seen a anything quite like it. it Vladimir Putin was the spy who came in from the cold today because the, the, the world which had held him at arm's length over these crimes and these uh, aggressions. Uh, he was welcomed with open arms uh, uh, with President Trump, who amazingly um, took the, you know, the headline uh, in the British, in the BBC tonight was Trump sides with Putin over FBI. I mean, that is the headline tonight. Uh, I, you know, where do you where do you start on this except um, the with President Trump? I, I have to. I, I'm just wondering what is he what is his next tweet going to be or how is he going to take this this unbelievable criticism today that he got as you mentioned not just from John, but John McCain Mitt Romney just tweeted uh, uh, the Fox News host amazingly uh, I saw Geraldo Rivera. Um, Neil Cavuto, these are people who like, you know, 
basically saying to watch President Trump bend the knee to Putin today was something none of us in our lifetime ever thought we would see. Uh, and, and, and right now, I mean, a lot of people are thinking this is a, a crisis. We're in a crisis mode here. We're in a constitutional crisis. First, let me just say I'm honored to be here with Carla, who I'm a great fan. <laughs> I read her material, and she is one of the best political reporters around. And, of course, when John calls, I always say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just got off the air on KGO, and I made a statement. And those of you who listen to me on the air know I'm, I'm relatively careful in what I say. <laughs> Donald Trump today, in my judgment, qualified under articles of impeachment for treason. And <clears throat> I, don't, I don't want to say this lightly. I want to explain it to you because I know how people feel about Donald Trump. I'm not talking about Donald Trump's policies. I'm not talking about his stands on the environment or, or the other issues, the uh, Supreme Court. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the simple fact that the Constitution defines treason this way. It's Article 3. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them. That he didn't do, right? But here's the second part, the or. Or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Mm. Now, I... I I understand the partisan nature. We are on a clock, and I want to be very clear. Today, Donald Trump gave aid and comfort to our enemy. And not only do I say that, and many of you know I worked for Richard Nixon. I went through a lot of uh, situations. I, believe me, remember Watergate vividly. Uh, but this is worse than Watergate. This is a betrayal of the United States of America by the President of the United States. This morning, uh, or rather this afternoon on KGO, I played the presidential oath of office, and I cited a number of presidents. It's 35 words. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God, by the way, is, and the, is added on at the end. It's not part of the oath. 35 words. Donald Trump today violated his oath of office. Now, the question becomes, what next? The answer is not the Democrats. The answer is the Republicans. Right. And I want to remind you, and I'll do it quickly, that Richard Nixon did not leave office because of the Democrats. It was August the 7th, 1974, when Barry Goldwater, senator from Arizona, Mr. Republican, Mr. Conservative, Hugh Scott, the former chairman of the Republican National Committee in the 48 campaign and who also was major a minority leader of the Senate, and John Rhodes, the Republican leader in the House, went down to see Richard Nixon at the White House. They didn't ask him to resign. But Dick Nixon asked Barry Goldwater, finally, a simple question. How many votes do I have in the Senate, Barry? And Barry Goldwater answered, Mr. President, you have six votes at most, and I am not one of them. And that was the end of the Nixon presidency. It was not the Democrats. It was not the accusations. It was the proof positive. I believe with all my heart, and I say it with great sadness and deep regret, I would rather be arguing today over the issues that Donald Trump has raised and what I believe are genuine issues uh, that confront America. But when a president of the United States betrays, listen carefully, betrays his country, as Donald Trump did today, the outrage of the American people must be loud and clear, without any question. But the question is, Carla? will will the outrage be loud? And I think that the, that's where we're at today. When you right now, we're still waiting for many Republican leaders to weigh in on this, and you you would have thought they would have. Perhaps, though, as I indicated earlier, I mean, there have been some folks, there have been some folks who have been critical of Trump all along, you know, the, the never-Trumpers. Right. Um, but today, House Speaker Paul Ryan, who has been very reticent to take on the president, he said flat out, Trump, that, that Russia is not our ally and that there is no question Russia interfered in our election. Orrin Hatch, Jeff Flake, Trey Gowdy, Lindsey Graham, John McCain, who said no prior president has ever abased himself more abjectly before a tyrant. David Frum and Charles Sykes also weighed in with condemnations. Uh, former Republican Congressman Joe Walsh commented, right. quote, Trump was a traitor today. I cannot and will not support a traitor. 
no decent American should, unquote. Ann Applebaum, so it's not just all men who are criticizing him, Ann Applebaum, who's no left-winger, she wrote, quote, Trump has just composed the most elaborate thank you note in history. As millions watched around the world, he said it out loud, thank you, Vladimir Putin, for helping me win my campaign, unquote. Did you see the Washington Post editorial? It's well worth reading because the contention is that Donald Trump today proved collusion. Now, let me remind you, collusion is not a, an impeachable offense. It is not. But the simple fact is that today, Vladimir Putin said, without any hesitation or doubt, that he wanted Donald Trump to win the election. And I want to say something else that infuriated me. Donald Trump, again, criticized Hillary Clinton and tried to deflect the clear and present indictment uh, submitted by his own Justice Department, uh, 12 Russians named, read the indictment, read the indictment. Uh, Donald Trump went off on Hillary Clinton, the server, the whole nine yards. And I can only tell you, to me, it is shameful. Not that Hillary Clinton was pure as the driven snow. Not that there were not things that Hillary Clinton did wrong. She did. But Hillary Clinton is not the President of the United States. Donald Trump is. One more quick point. Donald Trump's plane is in the air even as we speak. And the real question will be when he lands. You know, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, refused to comment on what had happened. The State Department website, as of this recording, refuses to comment on what Donald Trump did. The question will be, what will the people around Donald Trump say? One of my favorite books is a book called Resignation in Protest. There are American political leaders who have worked for presidents of the United States who have resigned because they felt they could not serve a president. What will Mike Pompeo do? What will General Kelly do? What will John Bolton do? What will the... No, and you laugh at that, but let me remind you there has been no harsher critic of Russia and its role than John Bolton. These people, these people now are on the spot. So it's not when this recording is played, it's what happens when we wake up tomorrow morning and we listen to what they have to say. But, I, but I'm wondering, uh, I mean, because I think Bolton did an interview this afternoon, if I'm not mistaken, and basically tried to uh, explain away what happened. My uh, Vice President Pence in a tweet, uh, uh, congratulated the president for a, just a wonderful uh, uh, overseas trip. That's the I mean, job of a vice president. Right. The job of a vice president is to support a president no matter what. And remember, Mike Pence is in the wings. If, if Donald Trump, right. if something happens, he will be president. <laughs> That's a whole other topic, John. But, but I guess my question is... A whole other John, program. My, 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 my question is, John... Haven't we seen what should be an outrage factor long before this that they have just stood silent on? You only need to have to go to that house meet the house uh, in, in last Friday when, mini -meeting when it was last week. Just unbelievable, appalling in every way. But look, it's true. But let me explain. We want as Americans to believe our president, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, we are conditioned to have reverence for the presidency. And I believe that to be an important quality in stabilizing our country. Only when it is proven beyond a reasonable doubt that there is something flawed do we react. And the example, of course, of Richard Nixon, and yes, the example of Bill Clinton. Nobody, nobody disputed the fact that Bill Clinton committed perjury and obstructed justice. He did. He admitted it. Uh, several days before he left office in a plea deal so he wouldn't be indicted after he left office. We, the American people, chose not to make it an offense for which he should be removed from office. Well, let me tell you that that is what I hope Congress will do. They need to meet, put together a resolution of impeachment, which is, by the way, like an indictment. They need to do it in a fair fashion, and then you understand the process. The members of the Senate are sworn in separately as a jury, and they are required to, pre to, re uh, to present impartial justice. And I think it is worth saying that whether you believe 
Donald Trump is guilty or not, and we don't know because the Mueller report hasn't come out. What we do know is what the President of the United States did today. On this day, July the 16th, 2018, is unprecedented in the history of this country and deserves full inquiry by the Congress. And I think one other thing I think is really important, Vladimir Putin twice today sidestepped the question right. on whether there is some kind of compromising material. He did it in the press conference uh, where he just laughed it off and said, well, we never thought he was that important. Again, in an interview with Chris Wallace, said the same thing. The, the fact is that you know, President Trump was outgunned from the beginning on this meeting. We still don't know what went on in the two hours and 10 minutes, which, by the way, the White House didn't tell our press corps how long the meeting was or any details. They got that all from the Russian side. I, 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 if I may, yeah. some, someone actually wrote in uh, the $64,000 question is, who, who is Trump's Russian translator? He needs to be offered immunity to reveal the contents. <laughs> no, if, if, no, I, if no. I may, if I may just add a John. little light note, I was in Canada three weeks ago, and we were having a wonderful time. And the one question repeatedly asked me was, "John, are you here seeking asylum?" <laughs> <laughs> it's true, and and I just say too, the president during this trip has denigrated the American press on foreign soil. I mean, uh, repeatedly, and I think to watch that press conference today, you had to give a shout out to the reporters who asked appointed tough great tough questions. Here, here. That's what the free press is about. And but Carla, they're fake news. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, let and, me. And that was a line essentially repeated by Vladimir Putin. Okay. On that, they agreed to. I mean, let, let me ask a challenging question from the audience. Might not be a popular one, but listen, to it, bear it out. The world is changing. You know, we're not anymore the the monolithic power. Um, I'm paraphrasing the question here. Uh, is, is some of what Donald Trump is trying to do simply recognizing the fact that we can't dictate to Russia, we can't dictate to Europe? He's trying to use the power that, of course, as he understands it, in negotiating and making deals and and, and such. Um, is there anything? And, and I think that is what some of the Trump supporters. I mean. Uh, uh, are, are trying to say today mm -hmm. that uh, that the president was trying to make a point that we need to get along with Russia. And as somebody, like, as I said, who covered the downfall of the Soviet Union, I was re rem right. remembering uh, that after that happened, I went to a dinner at the Getty House here in San Francisco where George Shultz, then Secretary of State, and Mikhail Gorbachev uh, sat together, clinked glasses, and said, you remember how we used to spy on each other? How they, you know, hey, now we're all friends, glass nose, right? Uh, but things have changed, and now, I mean, there there is no question that what Putin has done, Putin is not Gorbachev, and what, <laughs> by any stretch, and what Putin has done needs to be held to account. Um, yes, we need good relations, uh, but the fact is, you can't let uh, a government and a strong man uh, assassinate people and uh, and jail journalists and annex countries, etc., and and not uh, I mean ha hold him to account. You, you mentioned George Shultz, who was, of course, Ronald Reagan's uh, Secretary of State, and uh, there was a summit. Some of you may remember the Reykjavik summit in Iceland, and that was at least for me in my old New Republic reading days, where I first learned the word spin. Spin doctors came out, right. and the, exactly. the administration spin doctors came out after that summit. That was a summer where uh, Ronald Reagan met with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, and they put everything on the table as far as nuclear weapons. Total denuclearization. It blew people's mind. People started saying, "Ronald Reagan's losing it. He, you know, should not be trusted with to to go in and make those kinds of deals." And of course, the, the deal wasn't made. Uh, Margaret Thatcher was apoplectic about it because her whole re-election campaign was based upon retaining the nuclear deterrent. Um, there, this is, seems to be some reprieve. Now, the diff actually, before I throw that to you guys, the difference of this is, as uh, Jacob Weisberg, who uh, is definitely not a right-winger, uh, wrote in a recent uh, biography of Ronald Reagan, he was saying, actually, that is what Ronald Reagan wanted. That Ronald Reagan had a long-standing, mm -hmm. absolute horror of what a nuclear war could bring. Um, so he welcomed, yeah, and, and George Schultz has right. backed this up. Right. Um, that, so we have some similarities here. People are saying, is he qualified to be in that kind of a conver uh, conversation? But 
w that's when you learn the background of, of Ronald Reagan's feelings, that's only, yeah. that, that actually makes exactly you feel right. a little right. more comfortable. You, you, I have heard seems to make Schultz many other. times talk about the kind of preparation that went into the Reykjavik summit. Yeah. Um, it, it, there's just no comparison to what went on this week. And we are so far from, you know, trust but verify and uh, shining city on the hill and Mr. Gorbachev take down that wall that, I, I, you know, we're, we're like in a, in a different uh, era here. Can I, can I separate two issues? Please. One is the power of the President of the United States. Whoever is President of the United States is critical. Imagine if Al Gore had taken the oath instead of George W. Bush. The course of history in the world would have been profoundly different. So the one thing we know is that there are consequences to who we elect as President. The second thing is no one is in favor of going to war with, with Russia. No one wants to have diplomatic crises with Russia. But when you think about the necessity of being firm, particularly when the United States of America was attacked by a foreign power, and for a president of the United States to stand as Donald Trump did today next to the president of Russia and excuse that attack, it is intolerable. So we need to do something which is hard. We need to separate these two considerations. And so I believe, I believe in getting along with the Russians, but not letting them get away with things that are intolerable. And I think when you think about what happened at the NATO summit, and we get to that, our NATO allies are very concerned. Do you, are you aware that the American ambassador to Estonia resigned because he felt that what Donald Trump was doing was a betrayal of America? Are you familiar with the fact that the fear is that Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and as all of you know, the other former Soviet satellites are terrified. Now, I'm willing to concede that Russia has reason to be concerned. They were invaded three times in the last century. They understand their vulnerability. They want to have a buffer. They want to be protected. But that is the kind of thing that the president and his people should be working on in trying to solve problems with Russia, not allowing Russia to interfere directly in an American election. And I want to be crystal clear. The voting booths weren't, weren't targeted. But I've been in politics a long time. We do targeted ads. All of you know that. Ads are prepared to hit particular constituencies. And the Russians did just that in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, uh, in Michigan, and in Ohio, in those critical states. Don't ask me, ask Facebook, which fronted those ads and mm -hmm. now understands that. So when they say no votes were tampered with, technically they're right. But they are wrong when they say that Russia did not particularly target vulnerable constituencies in order to ensure that they would not vote for Hillary Clinton. And that is also something that needs to be examined and understood clearly by the American people. And, and I would just underscore, they weren't, go ahead. Uh. Thank you. They weren't just targeting potential Trump voters. They were also targeting Jill Stein potential voters. They were targeting Bernie Sanders voters. That's right. People who were Absolutely. amenable to hearing that Hillary Clinton 100%. was the Antichrist. Yeah, right. right. And, and also to say that they weren't successful in getting into the voting booths, we know they tried in some states. And uh, Secretary of State Alex Padilla has said that and has warned that if they tried in the last election, they're going to try in the next election. And yet we have heard nothing from Washington on any kind of uh, hearings or any kind of uh, um, efforts to stop that from happening. Someone in the audience writes, and I feel sad because they write, we are going to England next week for a five-week vacation. What are we supposed to tell people who want to talk about <laughs> Trump? Uh, good luck with that. Good luck with that. I just came back from... <laughs> Someone just said, tell them you're Canadian. <laughs> I was just... I, I, it, I, may I say, yeah. it's what I... It's what I told people about Richard Nixon in 1974 and after his resignation in 1975. People said he was very good on foreign policy. How, how could you remove him? And my answer was, look at what he did and understand the values that the American people have. When a politician, a president of the United States, violates those rules, and I want to make something crystal clear, the president of the United States is not 
above the law. No matter what, no matter what President Trump's former attorney John Dowd has said, no matter what Rudy Giuliani, his current <laughs> attorney, yeah, says. Right. And one of the things I did is I played on the air, and those of you who listen to us on KGO know I use a lot of sound. I used David Frost's question to Richard Nixon when Nixon said, if the president does it, it's okay. It's legal. We don't accept that. And I know we're going to get to the question of uh, Mr. Kavanaugh, who has mm -hmm. been nominated for the Supreme Court, and I hope we do, because he wrote a very interesting article, I'll save this, for the Minnesota Law Review that is absolutely stunning. But you're going to get to that. But we'll get to that. Before we leave uh, Europe, I did want to talk, because, of course, before the meeting in Finland with, with Putin, Donald Trump had a very nice and cordial meeting <laughs> at uh, NATO headquarters oh. where... I think the main, I mean, really nothing could go wrong except that poor John Kelly didn't get a full uh, breakfast, <laughs> eggs and bacon a breakfast. full breakfast. Did you yeah. watch, I mean, really and truly, it, it's, it's wonderful. If you watched John Kelly's disgust listening to Donald Trump, it was astounding. And oh, ladies and gentlemen, it's only because he didn't have a proper breakfast. John, are you providing proper snacks for us tonight? I have a Kickstarter program set up to, to raise money to send it's, breakfast to John Kelly. I mean, and that interview in the sun, I mean, yeah, how okay. do you... I, I, how, explain that. Yeah, I mean, know. He never said it. No, he never. He said he never said it. I mean... But we have tapes. <laughs> That's right. I mean, just as he's dining with Theresa May, uh, The Sun releases this blockbuster interview in which Trump essentially stomps all over her and says how he wishes her opponents would be uh, would be prime minister. That Boris, mean, Johnson Boris Johnson would, would be Boris Johnson prime resigned, minister. resigned as foreign minister to protest the policy. And who does not? The, the president of the United States endorses the opponent of the prime minister who is standing on the platform with him. It's, you know, if I could go back in a time machine two years and write a novel based on what has happened, <laughs> you can't. no publisher would have agreed to see me. <laughs> I mean, if calling, Christopher Buckley wouldn't be able calling to NATO our foe, <laughs> as he did. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the European Union. The, the European Union. I mean, he, and, and you now have... Um, EU officials tweeting, a German official, high, a very high level German official tweeted today, we can no longer count on the United States. Angela Merkel said that several months ago. Yeah. yeah. So this is, this is not new. But what do you do uh, when I was in Canada? We have no finer friend. We have no closer, uh, closer trading ally. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, really wonderful relations. I want to tell you something. They can't understand what's wrong with us. No. They don't hate America. I wouldn't even say they hate Trump. They just shake their heads in incredulity that the American people, as sophisticated as we are, as knowledgeable as we are, that we would tolerate this, well, I, w I don't want to say buffoonery because it's worse than buffoonery. It's... <laughs> Indescribable. No, and I think I mean just I've just come back from uh, Europe myself, and and I, that was those were the questions I was getting. You know, people are looking at things like this family separation policy and saying what, what, oh. what is going on? I mean, the, the position of the United States as a moral leader is so is disintegrated, and you can only by seeing that by these uh, protests this week in London were were uh, astounding. I have to say, when it came to the child separation thing. Um, this is my confession to you. My first day of kindergarten, I did not want to be separated from my mommy. <laughs> and my mother stayed for a full week until I was distracted by Evie Wheel, whose father owned Fantasia Bakery. <laughs> and there was a good reason to be distracted. But I will tell you my own memory. I know how I felt, and every one of you had a similar experience. When our son Samuel was a little boy, and they used to call him my appendage because people thought he'd never learned to walk because I carried him everywhere. <laughs> he was separated. There were, m Ellen was taking him, my wife was taking him on a trip. He put his arms around me and held me so tightly and cried. I've never forgotten it. Almost a quarter of a century later, when you think of a child being separated from a parent, and let me say, as a parent, a parent being separated from a child. And when you have 
the Attorney General of the United States citing the Bible <laughs> as defense, I must say to you, this is something where Donald Trump retreated, and I want you to know why he retreated. He retreated because, although it didn't change the policy. No, it hasn't changed, changed the policy. But he at least verbally retreated because the outrage from right and left was so great. But I can only tell you from a personal point of view, we can talk about immigration, we can talk about the problems America has, we can do all of that. But separating a parent from a child, a child from a parent, is unconscionable. And people around the world are watching these videos. Those, those are the questions I got. You know, I mean, you're now, and more stories are going to be coming out now. You're looking at kids. You, I don't know if any of you saw the video of the little boy being reunited with yes. his father with just a vacant look on his face. He almost looked like he was drugged. Uh, he was bruised. I mean, what is happening to these children? That this is the kind of, and the, and the sad part of these this whole story is we're watching, as you said, the circus, and that story is getting shoved to the side. Nobody's talking about that story anymore. Did you this see week. the little girl being held by her mother? And the mother was, the little girl was patting her mother on the back <laughs> to reassure her mother. No, I mean, this, it's, Carl is absolutely yeah. right. We should not be diverted from this, yeah. and it's a serious matter. As God is my witness, I thought we would spend most of tonight talking about Scott Pruitt <laughs> leaving. <laughs> uh, we're not even going to get to that. <laughs> I, I, I think this is That's maybe a good old. time to actually, though, move into something we've, we've touched on, which is the Supreme Court nomination. Right. Um, this is something that, again, there's one of these things that's going on in the background while we're looking at other, you know, dumpster fires. But uh, this is moving along. I mean, I, there's been, uh, I mean, a lot of worry on the left that, you know, for example, Roe versus Wade uh, will yes. get overturned, that the Supreme Court's going to be conservative for the next generation or two. On the right, there's a lot of, well, yeah, that was what this is all about. And someone in the audience wrote in a card saying, this is, this is what a lot of conservatives are willing to put up with a lot on, on right. Donald Trump, that they don't agree with, that they're even really bothered by because they feel very strongly about you know, the unborn. Yeah. They feel very strongly about you know, these issues they want from the Supreme Court. So you can take that a couple ways, maybe. Now that he maybe has uh, two picks on the Supreme Court, do, does some of that uh, loyalty start to erode because they've secured that beachhead, if you will, or he's delivered for them, therefore they get they deliver yeah. him? Yeah, and, and the question is now, what can the Democrats do? And this is something uh, we've talked to Senator Feinstein this week uh, uh, in Oakland and said, you know, what can you really do? You don't have the votes to do anything. And she said, uh, she's, of course, the ranking Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, uh, said she wants to assure people that she is now sort of as that in that position in charge of vetting. Uh, there's a, a lot of vetting she's she's responsible for, and that she is coming basically has uh, surfaced come up with a million documents related to uh, uh, Kavanaugh, uh, including she said uh, about 160,000 emails from. Um, uh, uh, Justice Kav uh, uh, Kagan. Um, that Kagan to uh, Kavanaugh? Yeah, apparently. And she said, uh, basically said, she wanted to assure Democrats <laughs> that, um, you know, there are Democrats in these red states who look like they may uh, be under great pressure uh, to confirm. And she said, we're going to provide them, We our hope was to provide them with enough uh, information about uh, this nominee that they will be able to vote with a clear conscience uh, uh, against him. Um, and, and I think uh, that is the, the challenge for the Democrats. They don't have a lot of ammunition here. Uh, but she, she also said uh, the, the voices of average voters out there, uh, which made a huge difference uh, when the Affordable Care Act uh, was under, under the gun, um, that that is that may be the deciding factor here too. And both Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski have said they uh, are waiting to hear from people all over the country on this. During the late presidential campaign, I indicated repeatedly in all of my broadcasts and in public appearances that we were not voting just for a president. We were voting for the Supreme Court. And I want to indicate to you in the strongest possible terms that the odds are that Judge Kavanaugh will be confirmed. But let's assume for a minute that he isn't. There is a list from the Heritage Foundation, 25 judges, that the president will simply turn to another nominee. 
When we voted for Donald Trump, we voted for a conservative bent on the court, and had Hillary Clinton won, it would have been a liberal bent on the court. We have to hope, those of us who believe very strongly, that the Constitution is a vital, vibrant document. I disagree profoundly with the President and just Kavanaugh that who claims originalism. You should interpret the Constitution as it was written. One of the things that I learned in high school, in, in junior high school, in grammar school, was that the Constitution was a document that was flexible. It was an elastic document. It was supposed to be interpreted and reinterpreted. And I think that is the key. So I don't want to discourage anybody uh, from voicing their opinion. But the simple truth is the court is taking that turn. And I can only say, I hope, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer, <laughs> who are in their 80s, don't retire. And may I, just, may I just say, Bill Rehnquist was a friend of mine. I met him here in San Francisco in 1964 at the Republican National Convention. Some of you will recall my interview with him when he wrote his book on impeachment. I was one of the few people who he agreed to sit down with. I want to use my fingers, and I want the camera to film this. <laughs> Rehnquist went on the court in 1971. He became Chief Justice in 1986. He served, by the way, I used to kid him, I'd say, how many presidents have you served under? And he would say, no, no, John, I don't serve under, I serve with. <laughs> Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush. Hmm. Seven presidents of the United States. When Donald Trump said he will influence the court for the next 20, 30, or maybe even 40 years, that's the simple reality. Someone in the audience asks, uh, can the Democrats deny the Supreme Court vote a uh, quorum? They no. don't really have any power. In no, there's no quorum. And you may recall Harry Reid, the former Democratic leader, mm -hmm. who is ever a lasting disgrace, is the one who eliminated the uh, idea that you needed 60, the filibuster rule. And that, I, many of you, again, if you listen to me on KGO know, I was furious when he did that. And I say it will come back to haunt us. And Harry Reid... It has. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk California politics for a bit here. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> well, I want to start with a, a story Carla, I know, has written about. Um, let's see. Uh, there's, which is basically the ongoing battle between, for lack of a better term, the, the Bernie wing of the party and uh, the Democratic Party and the Hillary wing of the Democratic Party. If you thought they'd all come together and started singing Kumbaya, you're wrong. Um, uh, in a California State Assembly race, Oakland Mayor Libby Schaff, San Francisco's new mayor, London Breed, uh, both endorsed Buffy Wicks, right. uh, who is yeah. described as an establishment Repub Democrat. Uh, she, uh, she's a, a progressive Democrat, but she was w one of Obama's uh, main grassroots organizers. That's in establishment. His, in his presidential campaign. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they, they endorsed her over a Bernie Sanders-backed Democratic socialist called uh, is it Jovanka? Jovanka Beckles, who's a uh, Richmond City Councilwoman. Right. This right. is for District 15 seat in the East Bay. Tell us a bit about this and what, what do, does it? Do, yeah, is this, this, this is what we're saying. I mean, I spent the weekend at this uh, California Democratic uh, Convention in Oakland, uh, you know, and, and, and this is what we're seeing. It's essentially a uh, circular firing squad um, uh, where you've got the Bernie Kratz and the centrist Democrats, uh, and they're both passionate about what they believe. Um, and in races like this, especially in this top two primary situation, mm -hmm. Democrats are going at each other hammer and tongs, and we're seeing that in the U.S. Senate race as well. And we're I guess we'll talk about that too. Uh, but you know, th this race in the East Bay is the most probably the most competitive assembly race in the state. Um, and uh, you have uh, Buffy Wicks, uh, who's been endorsed by most, you know, Gavin Newsom, Kamala Harris, etc., and Jovanka Beckles, who's been endorsed by Bernie Sanders, and who voted for Jill Stein. In the, in the November election. Um, so this is where Democrats, uh, you know, are at. And we saw this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, battle go on in the U.S. Senate race as well. You want, you want us to talk about that? Yeah, let, let's move in. Yeah. You're at yeah. the, the point convention. out quickly, we sure. saw it in New York City. Yes, yes. right, a exactly. a congressional race where a man who seemed destined to be Speaker of the House, 
who outspent his opponent 18 to 1, was defeated decisively. But this is part of what the Democratic Party is going through. People ask me, who is the leader of the Democratic Party? I have no idea. And the Democratic Party doesn't know. There is no articulate voice uh, to lead the Democratic Party. And so the great challenge, and it will begin really after the November election, will be for Democrats to define who their candidate for president will be and what direction they want to take the party. Right. But even going up to the November election, they've got a lot of challenges here in California. Yeah, right. uh, these House races, uh, you know, the, the road to flipping the House may go through California, is, will go through California. Mm -hmm. um, they've got this gas tax repeal, which a lot of Republicans are going to come out and vote on. And yet this weekend, uh, the big fight, and this was the headline coming out of it, was the party executive committee did not endorse Dianne Feinstein in the U.S. Senate. They endorsed Kevin DeLeon, the state, the more progressive uh, senator. It's, it's exactly what you said, a kind of generational battle, an ideological battle. Uh, and then you, you know, but Democrats have got to ask themselves, is this what they want to be putting their attention to, uh, to, to not endorse Senator Feinstein? Um, was a huge headline today, and uh, you know Fox News talked about it incessantly. Uh, the fact is, she won seventy percent of the vote in the primary. Mm -hmm. uh, she has ten million dollars in the bank compared to uh, uh, Senator De Leon, who only has six hundred thousand. But he's making the case, and he did it this weekend. We talked to him many times. Uh, we need Democrats to go in there, you know, abolish ICE, impeach the president. Um, you know, shut down the Senate. Do not let that hearing on the Supreme Court happen. It's a very, it's a, it's a um, agenda that a lot of he has a lot of impassioned followers. Certainly, red who meat for his followers who probably don't eat red meat. And the happiest, <laughs> the happiest people followers. about this division are the Republicans. They are positively thrilled. So I hope that the Democratic Party will be able to come together ultimately. And uh, it's going to be a real challenge because you can't beat somebody with nobody. And if your party is deeply divided, well, you've got a problem at the polls. Yeah, and if your party has to spend money on this U.S. Senate race, these House races, at least seven of them here in California, right. are very big deals. And the other thing I didn't hear any talk about this weekend was this gas tax uh, repeal. And I have to tell you, the Republicans are telling me, look, we've got 400,000 people on our, in our emails uh, we've raised uh, more than a million dollars on this. People are going to come out of the woodwork to vote against this gas exactly. tax because it's easy. It's a very easy bumper sticker. I'm going to vote against the tax. Uh, there's no real plan for, well, how do you fix the roads and, you know, uh, potholes here in California without this gas tax. But the fact is that uh, the Republicans wanted this gas tax repeal on the ballot precisely to get their people out to vote in these districts uh, and that, that they, this could make the difference between flipping the House and not flipping that. And remember how Gray Davis went down. Yeah. Gray Davis went down because of the additional tax, and that was a key element by conservatives in this state who wanted him defeated. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a critical factor. Yeah, so we have to see if, you know, is Jerry Brown going to come out and throw money at this and campaign? I think that's the next question. And I think are Democrats going to be able to bury their differences and move ahead and look at um, uh, the real prize, which is those House seats for them? That's what it's all about. That's job one. Carla mentioned Jerry Brown. I want to mention Gavin Newsom. Mm. Gavin Newsom is going to be the next governor of California. When he is elected governor of California, he will automatically be a major contender for the presidential nomination in 2020. So there are real consequences in terms of Gavin Newsom's role and where he stands and how he defines himself and his governorship. I just wanted to throw that out because Jerry, I think, tell me, Carla, you yeah. correct me, that he, he and his wife have purchased a ranch. Yeah, yeah. He's going back to the ranch. Yeah, he wants, although there, I have to say, there's a lot of talk about, you know, Jerry Brown, maybe he's 80 years old, but, uh, you know, uh, he, he ought to go for it this time and, and run against Trump. Uh, is, is everybody aware this would be his fourth campaign for president? <laughs> but that would be a great debate, would it not? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, but, you know, the fact is you're, you're absolutely right. We saw Gavin Newsom there the, this weekend. He definitely um, is talking about party unity. I think he uh, is going to be really, really interesting to watch and a big public figure to watch, as is Kamala Harris. We've seen her in a couple of recent polls and national stories. She's now in the top, you know, three list of and who most, might be running for president. Most certainly for vice president. 
And I think that's also a critical factor because she's articulate, she's solid, she has good credentials, uh, and uh, somebody said, but gee, she will only have served uh, uh, four years in the United States Senate. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah. So that's sort of like not an obstacle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, Gavin Newsom. Uh, how many of you think Gavin Newsom should debate John Cox, his, his Republican opponent? How many of you think you should uh, ignore John Cox and not debate him at all? <laughs> or that it's not important? Most of you don't seem to have an opinion. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, he has agreed to, to one debate. Uh, and uh, Not at the Commonwealth no. Club, unfortunately, no. Yeah. It's, uh, it's on CNN. Yeah, it's yeah. with CNN. And actually, he took that over one that would have been run by the San Francisco Chronicle and K, uh, KCRA, um, I guess, TV? Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Was that a good move? And why CNN? Why go with a national? Well, I think from, from what I hear... It, Unless you're running for president, you want to... Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's you, you're you're going to get a lot more viewers. You get a lot more viewers than CNN. We, uh, we understand it might be uh, Jake Tapper who does... Uh, moderates that he's uh, he's a super solid journalist. I have great admiration for him, uh, and, and I think the idea for Gavin Newsom is um, why do you want to elevate uh, uh, Mr. Cox uh, to that? that he, uh, remember, John Cox has never been elected to anything. He's run for office uh, more than half a dozen times. In Not Illinois. only in California, he's run in, in Illinois. In Illinois, and he's never been elected to anything. But the fact is, he is latched onto this gas tax and other right. issues, um, and so I think. That race, the, that race could be closer than people think. Remember why John Cox came in second? Because he was endorsed by Donald Trump. Trump made a big thing about it, and that's how Cox broke out. Let me just express my own view. I believe in debates. I believe in absolutely constant debates. I would like to see them debate all over the state of California. Uh, because I believe, and I, I will never forget discussing this with Barbara Boxer when she ran against Bruce Hershenson back in 1992. Bruce is brilliant, he's glib, but he uses the same lines over and over again. He doesn't have the flexibility. And I said to Barbara, don't be afraid to debate him. You'll learn all of his lines. <laughs> and if you learn all of his lines, you're in a lot better shape. Of course, they didn't have that kind of thing. But let me just, uh, Barry Goldwater told me this story, and I, it's worth repeating. He and John F. Kennedy had agreed that if they ran against each other for president in 1964, they would campaign from Air Force One together, that they would travel around the country and meet in cities and debate Lincoln-Douglas style <laughs> on issues like Medicare, Vietnam, Social Security, TVA, all of the major issues. Now, let me tell you, Goldwater, with a tear in his eye, said, when the bullet killed John Kennedy... It killed that process and my hope of being president. I want a choice, and I want to be crystal clear on this. I oppose the idea of a runoff between the top two vote-getters. I want a choice between a Republican and a Democrat. And let me say that Cox is very different than mm -hmm. what we would confront in a, in a real debate. He is a conservative Republican. I don't agree with him, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm a radio talk show host, so I don't have to be objective. Uh, <laughs> I want to see that kind of back and forth. So I hope that he and Gavin appear on the same stage, that they debate the great issues facing California, and that the people of this state have an opportunity to make a real choice, not an echo. It, you know, but I, I agree with you totally, John. I, I think, the, the, unfortunately, this age of social media has killed that idea of us ever seeing any Lincoln right. Douglas. These candidates now are just terrified of that YouTube moment that people are going to play back, you know, backwards and forwards uh, on uh, on social media. Um, you can't even get many of these candidates to do town hall meetings anymore. Go to go to the uh, town hall project website and check out how many Congress people here in California have never done a town hall meeting in years. And I have to say, I think we're lucky here in the Bay Area. We've got a couple of people. I saw uh, Eric Swalwell last weekend did two town hall meetings on Excellent. one day, including one hike with Eric Swalwell and talk to him while you're hiking. I mean, that's like, how, how like cool is that? At least you know he isn't <laughs> over the hill. <laughs> But, uh, but I think none of them great. will. Very few of them do yeah. that. I, I think um, Ro Khanna also is one who does one every month religiously. But very few 
of them do that, they're afraid of social media, and that is bad for the whole process. Right, I agree with Carla. Yeah. Someone in the audience writes, uh, regarding the gas tax, the first thing Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger did was uh, raise the vehicle registration fees. You say potato, I say potato. Which, which I alluded to earlier. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many of you saw, Adam, how do you pronounce the uh, former FBI agent's name, Peter? Is it Struck. 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 How many of you watched any of that testimony? I mean, oh yeah, right. yeah. I mean, it was that, it was compelling. Yeah, I thought but, compelling but, TV. But <laughs> before today's press conference, I mean, that was like the craziest thing. <laughs> you know. Right, exactly. Um, what did you think of that? I mean, that, there there were comments that that this was just the the craziest, uh, uh, kind of most vicious, if you will, uh, hearing in a while. But John, in particular, yeah. you've got the the yeah. better history there than I do. Was this as outrageously, I, I should say, as unique as it seemed to some folks. It was the most entertaining congressional hearing I have seen in years. <laughs> and if I were in charge of the National Democratic campaign dealing with congressional seats, I would cut it up and use it for commercials across the country <laughs> because it was a thorough embarrassment. But now I'm going to say something that I, I regret saying. It applies not only to those hearings, but it applies to Trump voters. Don't confuse them with the facts. People see what they want to see. But I thought it was a shameful display by the Republicans. And let me be clear, I was once a Republican. I was a liberal Republican. I was an Earl Warren, George Christopher, to put it in California context, mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. Republican. Mm -hmm. George Will, who by the way has left the Republican Party, observed that being a liberal Republican is a little bit like being a high church Unitarian. <laughs> it's possible, but pointless. <laughs> and I would suggest to you that is, that's the conundrum. But the Democrats have to paint a stark picture. They can't, they can't be afraid of painting that stark picture. The American people deserve to have that choice, and I hope the Democrats offer that choice. Yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I agree. I think uh, for the Republicans, I, I talked to many Republican sources, they were embarrassed watching okay. their own party um, uh, b basically personally attack uh, this FBI agent. I mean, the bottom line is he had the goods to, if he wanted to, uh, to make a phone call, to drop a dime to the media, or I mean, you understand many, what she means? Explain. Many other ways. Explain that. Oh, he she, he yeah, knew completely yeah. what was coming on Donald Trump. If he really wanted to destroy Donald Trump, all he had to do was pick up the phone and call Carla Marinucci. And she would have written a story that would have won her the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> but I want you to know, whatever you think of Strzok and his poor judgment and his affair yeah, and right, all the rest, right, exactly. he did not breach the confidentiality of being an FBI agent. And I have to tell you personally, I thought the way he conducted himself yeah, was exemplary. Yeah, I agree. I think he, he very much acquitted himself, and I think that it was an embarrassment, ended up being an embarrassment for the Republicans. Okay. Any thoughts on the 12 Russians who were indicted by <laughs> Bob Mueller? <laughs> have, have, may I just well, ask by show of hands, how many of you have read the indictment? Okay, okay. if you haven't, your homework assignment is to go home and Google it. It's right there. It's completely readable. It's very easy reading. It's very clear. It's very precise. It is as clear a statement of the Russian interference in the American election as anything you will ever read. It is a timeless document which should be read by all Americans. And I watched today when Chris Wallace of Fox, I won't call it news, tried to hand to Vladimir Putin a <laughs> copy of this document. That was a great moment in and TV. <laughs> Putin would have none of it. Well, the simple, the simple truth <laughs> is those 12 will never face American law. But the truth of what the Justice Department put together is so compelling, so overwhelming, it is irrefutable, and that is the shame of which the Russian interference demonstrates. It, that was one of the uh, jaw-dropping moments of this press conference yeah. where Donald Trump said, oh, but Putin is head of, has a fantastic idea. He'll send <laughs> his guys over and, and they'll investigate. And I just think that, <laughs> that is like, he thought it was wonderful. You know what it reminded, you know what it reminded me what of? It reminded me of what when Richard Nixon suggested that John Stennis, who was deaf, 
listen to the White House tapes <laughs> and certify them. It was that ludicrous. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of akin to inviting the burglar in, in and say, hey, what The fox you? into the chicken coop. <laughs> yeah, right. It was like literally um, amazing. And you're right. This is a 29-page indictment. It is so detailed. And to watch that interview with, with Chris Wallace, it was very telling. Uh, you know, with with Vladimir Putin, in which Putin said, "Well, you know, we would, of course, you know, we would never do this." But that information, we're I'm, we're very glad it got out because people needed to know about <laughs> Hillary Clinton. So he was basically endorsing the fact that that this that this information was leaked. Uh, and, and Donald and, Trump embraced that, and that is why I have no hesitation in saying, I believe that Donald Trump today committed treason and that we ought to apply the Constitution as it was written, and that should be thoroughly vetted and investigated. And if we had time, I'll, I'm on KGO tonight from, uh, from uh, 8 to 10 live, and I will discuss this in greater depth. This is a, a, a plug, of course, but uh, <laughs> this is something you need to understand. It's shameful, and what the president did today is disgusting. But, but the question, John, is will he be subpoenaed? And that's what yes. the question I think um, a it's lot a of great legal question. scholars are looking at. Uh, the question is, can a president be subpoenaed? The answer is that presidential materials can be. Richard Nixon's tapes were subpoenaed, and you will recall that uh, Nixon resisted it, claiming executive privilege, an eight to nothing decision by the United States Supreme Court with William Rehnquist recusing himself resulted in the president having to turn over the documents, which resulted in the revelation of the June 23rd tape, which ended the presidency. Bill Clinton was subpoenaed. Bill Clinton wisely said, I will testify voluntarily. But if you ask me, and, and by the way, he did, and to his everlasting, mm -hmm. well, he had no choice, mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe that a president not only can be subpoenaed, but I believe that ultimately this case may go all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And I want to suggest to you that you need to read the president's current nominee's statement in the Minnesota Law Review saying that a president should not be subpoenaed, should not be indicted, should not be investigated while he's president because a president is just too busy. If I were, if I were a member of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I would ask Judge Kavanaugh a simple question. Given your stated bias, would you recuse yourself if this came before the United States Supreme Court? And if he said no, that would be grounds to vote against his confirmation. But I'm saying this because I, I feel so strongly that a president isn't above the law. I worked for Richard Nixon. I admired Richard Nixon. Uh, my political experience was based on Richard Nixon. Uh, he gave me many breaks when I was a very young man, for which I will always be grateful. But when it came to the Watergate revelations, I was one of the first to call for his removal from office. I did so because I have to be able to go to bed at night with a clear conscience and wake up in the morning and look at myself in the mirror. And every Republican is going to face that challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On that note, actually, I know John has to head out early because he is heading right back to the station. So we're going to move on to our news quiz question. Uh, news quiz, uh, and Elizabeth is going to come up and help me with the prizes. Uh, By the way, Carla, we were told we could not participate. <laughs> When yeah. you giving away chocolate Sorry. at one of the previous <laughs> sessions, I did part it well, and I, I should not have done it. I apologize. <laughs> it's like Bastille Day, but uh, we're going to have lots more news quiz questions, and of course, I'm sure a lot more to talk about in two weeks on Monday, July 30th. It's a free from members night, and I believe we'll be up in the large auditorium again. Uh, for our next week-to-week, week. you can find week our week-to-week week 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 news quiz week on the, week online. And uh, thanks to our good panel today, Carla Marinucci and John Thank F. You. Rothman. Thanks, thanks, thanks to all coming. of you and everyone watching and listening online. Have a great week. All right, John. Hi.